I am Heather Shurtia, the Executive Director of Digital Wish, and I am so excited to have you guys here today. We are on a mission to solve the digital divide, and if you're here, that means that you need curriculum adoption strategies to do so. I have got two great guys here today to talk about what they did in the state of Arkansas. I'm going to show you my screen. Anthony Owen, the Arkansas State Director of Computer Science Education is here. And Don Benton, the Assistant Commissioner of Arkansas DOE. Now these two guys have known each other for years. And when COVID hit, the two of them joined forces and developed a lot of programs for solving some of those issues with COVID. Arkansas was ahead of the curve and they implemented a lot of programs very rapidly and very quickly. So we're going to learn more about what they did and how they did it. Anthony, I'm going to throw it to you. Thanks, Heather, and uh, appreciate your whole team. Uh, this has been a great experience so far, and just appreciate y'all inviting Arkansas to come on and represent some of the things that we did. Uh, I'm so honored to be on here with Don Benton, a fellow Ready alum. Uh, he actually is representing in the background there, I see, uh, Henderson State University, both graduates from there, and uh, uh, do go back some time together, and just um, I'm so blessed to, to work with great people such as Don. Um, Arkansas, whenever this hit, you know, Arkansas has always been committed to the students of our states and I know uh, of our state, I know a lot of states and leaders say that, but I think the work that Arkansas has done over the past year exemplifies exactly what that means and what that looks like. The governor made a commitment to put student, get students back into school in August and have face to face uh, offerings for them. Uh, and we felt that was so critical for the well-being and uh, the overall success of our students that that you know our, our team as a whole made that happen. But whenever we shut down in March, it was it was almost like we just shut everything off at once. And Don's team and my team and a lot of people at AD had to come together quickly and figure out how we were going to meet the kids in this new environment at home learning because Arkansas is committed to continuing that learning and was committed to continuing that learning. We didn't just stop it. We can't afford as a nation, we can't afford as a state just to stop that learning. So we're gonna share one thing that I, you know, I'm very proud that our state did. I didn't have a big role in it. Uh, Don's group, uh, you know, had a bigger role in this, but uh, it was a, a series of uh, videos and educational uh, opportunities through our public broadcast system uh, that ARPBS put out, worked with a lot of people around the state. And we have a short video that we would like to share on that if you don't mind playing that, Heather. I remember the day that Governor Hutchinson went on TV and told us that the schools were gonna be shut down then you see the country slowly start to shut down, almost like lights in a gymnasium slowly shutting off. It can be really terrifying. It was really terrifying. I remember sitting on the couch with my husband, watching and talking about the news coverage of the growing pandemic when the thought hit me. TV, that's the way. Arkansas PBS reached out to us and said, hey, how can we help? We're here. Let us know. How could we use and leverage the quality programming that was available to our students in our state and pair that with high quality teachers um, and lessons to, to kind of create this partnership? When the opportunity was presented to me shortly thereafter to be one of the hosts of the AMI shows, I immediately said yes. I honestly reacted before I even thought about it. I was like, absolutely, I will do that. That sounds amazing. I get to pretend to be Mr. Rogers. I thought that maybe I could make a little bit of difference during a time where a lot of students and teachers' worlds had been rocked. It's Monday morning. Oh, the songs. Coming up with the songs. Uh, you know, that was just a, how do we make this fun? And, you know, if you would have asked me, uh, prior to this experience, would you ever sing or play an instrument on TV? I would have said, no way. Let's kind of, you know, uh, help help students just see, you know, what, what's it like to be back in class? Like, we want those experiences. Uh, so how can we provide that through, through Arkansas AMI? 
in the classroom this year, a lot of my kindergartners, when they came into school for the first day, they were like, oh, you're the one from TV. Are we going to be on TV? And so it really was neat getting to connect with parents and students from all over. Hands down, the messages that still tug at my heart are the ones from parents telling me how much my presence meant to them or their child and how they would have children that were not in my band or grade level watching my episodes just so they could see someone who had skin or hair like them. I can scream and shout all day long that representation matters, but it means a whole lot more when parents and students articulate that. For two years, the Arkansas Arts Center, with support from the Arkansas Arts Council, developed an in-school residency combining the art of puppetry with the skills and processing of engineering. But with the pandemic closing schools, we could not implement it as planned. We looked for ways to pivot using the content created to help support students and educators and saw the incredible work that Arkansas PBS was doing in service of that mission with AMI programming. We reached out to see how our two organizations might work together to create a piece for broadcast in the final AMI programming week focused on STEM learning. Thus, Blueberry's Clubhouse was born. Hi everybody, I'm Blueberry, and this is my clubhouse, and this is my periscope. Come on with me on a super fun adventure. Arkansas AMI and Arkansas PBS did an incredible job of continuing to educate students at a time where education was not being offered through the traditional system. And so it was so wonderful to be able to be a part of that and offer quality programming inside of what they were offering to students. And the collaboration during this time was really just what students needed to get a, get a feeling that they were outside in the world, yet still, still they were confined to their homes. My whole family loved the show. I mean, what's not to love about Blueberry? It was just an incredible experience overall. Everyone was so incredibly kind and safe. Uh, they showed me so many things and they really taught me a lot about the arts and I've even picked up my own hobbies from Blueberry's Clubhouse. Making, I made a lot of puppets over the summer. <laughs> Be able to bring Arkansas, a lot of Arkansas, to people's homes while we're all stuck at home was something that was really special. I have three girls, an 11-year-old, a 7-year-old, and a 3-year-old. And what I love about um, Arkansas PBS is that it actually provides a range of programming, everything from just pure uh, entertainment to what I love uh, is Arkansas PBS did such a quick turnaround in the COVID world to provide alternative methods of instruction. So when they're learning some aspects of math, um, what I love to be able to do every now and then is just turn on the TV and they can see it in action or see it on some show. Now, Arkansas PBS is really a, a, a unique platform uh, that, is, that is today serving a range of Arkansans because of COVID, but it's also providing the foundation that we need uh, to make the right decisions that's grounded in, again, real content, real history, real facts, um, and allows us to engage in the processes of decisions that are being made. Relationships and connections are the heart of education. It's the foundation of the classroom, and being invited into the thousands of homes was truly, truly an honor. I was born and raised in Arkansas, and I feel such a deep, personal connection with the students and the teachers in our state. So it was it was truly a blessing to be able to help them in this way. I am very proud of our state for putting this together and for PBS because I know it was a lot of work on their part. It's just something I'm very proud of and it's something that a lot of teachers don't get to, you know, experience. When you think about people coming together and really collaborating in difficult times, this was that moment and they made something very difficult look very easy and there were so many people who worked on Arkansas AMI and I know, I know we made a difference.
So Heather, I want to say, first of all, thank you for letting us share that video. It's as a husband to a K-5 elementary educator who has been in the classroom and the father of two children that have been in the public school uh, over the past year, it's, it's hard for me sometimes to watch that and not lose a little bit of my composure. Um, you know, our teachers, and, and part of the reason I wanted to share that early on was the teachers, our teacher of the year, the people who went above and beyond, they're the heroes in all this. They're the ones that met the kids. Don, you know, not not to take any, you know, wind out of Don's sail, but we're, we're just here to support those people that are really doing the work. And that's, that's while we're sharing this, that's really what I want to, uh, you know, our thoughts to circle back to is that, that our job here at the DOE, regardless what it is, is to either, you know, in education, I think Johnny Key said it well when he first came on, in education, you have one of two jobs. You either help the kids or you help someone who is helping the kids. And Don and I are helping people who are really helping the kids. So I'm so appreciative of the work that our Arkansas educators have done, our partners in this have done over the past year and just couldn't be more proud of my state. So. Um, Don, I'm sorry to throw it to you on such a uh, kind of a um, emotional point, but I, I think it just speaks to the the passion that our state has um, uh, to make sure that that we're doing for our students and teachers what we need to do. Absolutely, Anthony. Thank you for saying some of the things that were on my heart as I was watching that video. Uh, and, and to I'm Don Benton, by the way. I'm Assistant Commissioner for Research and Technology, and I'm very privileged to work in partnership with Anthony Owen and the many people at the Department of Education to continue education. And I was thinking of all the emotions that I went through as I was watching that video. And like you, Anthony, I was kind of glad my video wasn't open then because I could kind of dab a few tears because we had a, a, a tumultuous year last year to say the least. Uh, we worked really, really hard in Arkansas to get schools ramped back up and ready for education. Face-to-face uh, -face and virtual uh, by August. Uh, we continued education in the spring as well. We realized uh, on March the 15th when that announcement was, was made by the governor that education in Arkansas was no longer going to be the same. It was no longer going to be the same across the country. And as Anthony said, we had so many things going on and so many things going so quickly and moving so fast, we didn't even have a chance to catch our breath. We were still trying to deal with not only the pandemic and the, the dangers that come along with pandemic, but what's most important, and that's our kids, and making sure that we we preserve their future and make sure we, we do things to, to keep them growing and learning and moving. And we realized early on that there, there, there is going to be social emotional impact involved with this pandemic and, and how learning was going to change, not only for our kids, but for our teachers as well. Our teachers became instant overnight educational leaders in digital learning. And if you can imagine transitioning from a face-to-face -face comfortable learning zone, and then boom, all of a sudden you're teaching online or partially online or face-to-face -face and online at the same time, man, that is totally overwhelming. And so as part of that, uh, I think you heard Stacy, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Stacy Johnson, Smith, Stacy Smith say at the end of that AMI, really helped us get through this and the partnerships that we had that were already in place. It was almost fortuitous that we had all these organizations already in place before the pandemic. We didn't have any idea. We didn't get a tip from anyone to be prepared for this. And then boom, all these partnerships just merged together and started making things happen. And as we were looking at, I remember that Sunday, my wife and I were watching television as one of the assistant commissioners, I didn't even know what the governor was going to say that day until he said it. And Anthony can vouch for that. None of us knew what was going to happen because all those decisions were made so quickly and so rapidly. And they were making these decisions based on research and what was going on and the limited amount of knowledge that we had. But when he said, we're not going to have um, school the same way and that face-to-face -face instruction was going to pause until we could get our thoughts together and figure things out. My wife and I were sitting there on the couch and as uh, Heather, if you wanna throw that this, this next slide up briefly, we were talking about what can we do? And my wife is an ed educator, just as Anthony's wife is an educator, it seems like most of us run in pairs. 
but what can we do to help our teachers? Well, fortunately for she and I, we had created a group called Schools Without Walls back in 2009, 2010 to help build professional development that revolved around online learning, <clears throat> mobile instruction, learning 24-7, 365. And as soon as the governor announced that, she and I were sitting there talking about what can we do to help our teachers? What can we do to help our friends? Just in our small group, we were thinking maybe a couple of hundred of our best friends get together, create a resource list so that we could share it with teachers. And we created this website called AMI for Arkansas Teachers. And within two weeks, we had over 20,000 users, 20,000 subscribers. Now we're up about 20 to 24,000. And it wasn't just educators. It was probably uh, 85 to 90% educators. But what was amazing is all the numbers of people who were just piling into this to get resources. And they were sharing all these wonderful resources. We were moderating. We, we had 15 administrators of moder moderating this. But it, it was a, a true testament to our teachers and how important it was for them to keep educating our kids. I mean, it was really just one of the biggest shining beacons in my career that said, we care and we've got to do something. We've got to make something happen. And we had 24,000 people now. What was interesting, we had people from different countries who heard about this. And so we represent 10 different countries that we're looking at our resources. And I'm thinking, this is just something we expected to get two or 300 people sharing resources. And here we are, we exploded. And that's, that's also indicative of what's going across the country as, as far as what people need and what our teachers want to do. They didn't want to quit and go home and not teach. They love their kids. Anyone who's been in education for any length of time you worry about your kids more than just about reading, writing, and arithmetic. You worry about what happens when they go home. You worry about all their, their, their life after school and before school. So we knew that this was just one teeny tiny little thing that we could do to help. And surprisingly, I was looking at some of the uh, statistics on the other day, 91% of those members are, are, are females. So that, that, that's an indicator to Anthony now also that women work harder than men as well. And man, they really ramped it up and they were knocking it out of the park. They were sharing thousands of resources. And I mean, literally thousands of free resources. They were sharing uh, information all the way from pre-K to higher ed. And it just exploded. I was amazed at, at the, the collaboration that was going on not only in our state, but around the country, but our state decided early on, we've got to do something to make sure that we don't leave kids stranded and that we don't leave teachers stranded. And we rose to the occasion. Has it been hard? Heck yes, it has been 110% hard. Have we all lost a lot of sleep? Yes. If you look at Anthony, Anthony lost all of his hair. He used to have as much hair as I did at one time. And it all fell out because of how hard he was working. I had hair like Anthony and never got a haircut. Yeah, but I made up for it with weight. <laughs> we, I think we all gained the COVID-15, didn't we, Anthony? <laughs> we did. And, and Don, I, I just, you know, I want to uh, jump in here just saying I commend you so much on the, the Facebook group, you know, where I, you know, I was early on because you had shared that that group that you were expanding that presence kind of internally with ADE staff. And, you know, I jumped on there and I was like, I, I kind of was like, okay, what is this? Is this going to be worthwhile? Or is this just another one that, is this just another, um, I may get in trouble for saying this, is this just another ADE Facebook page? Nope. Which is just the agency pushing information out, you know, not a lot of activity from the, the field. And I was absolutely amazed. I, I was amazed from the amount of people that got on there. And, and that was the reason that I, I told Heather when we first had this conversation, we've got to get Don on here because what y'all did with that was just absolutely phenomenal. It was such a, a whole, you know, a, um, a truthful way to reach people and get, get that feedback loop. Um, I know y'all went through some pains on the moderation occasionally. Oh yeah. In fact, occasionally I'd, I'd sit back and see things pop up and be like, I'm glad I'm not a moderator of that group <laughs> making a decision. Yeah, a few calls from the governor's office. Hey, yeah. watch this page. <laughs> so. yeah, you're right, Anthony. It was one of those things that kind of grew out of, out of thin air. It wasn't an ADE endorsed or sponsored Facebook page. It was just something we, we threw out there trying to just get a little collaboration going. 
And, and, and it, we just became kind of the moderators, not the drivers. And that's what educators do. Educators start driving the bus. They say, get out of my way, move, remove the barriers <clears throat> and let us drive. And that's what they wanted to do. And that so was Don, really cool. um, if somebody wanted to replicate your strategy that you took with Facebook and they said, I want to create my own, you know, Facebook page or my own Facebook group. What do you think were those key things that led to 20,000 members in, in a week? Or, you know, was it the urgency of COVID or if someone wanted to do a Facebook group now and they wanted to get that kind of take up, what, what were those key things that you learned along the way or those key things that you say, oh, that's, that's something that we did better than anybody else or criti well, you know, critical successes? Heather, I've had many, and I think Anthony can speak to this too. We've started many different Facebook pages and usually you're begging people to join them and you're trying to get folks. Exactly. Of course, the pandemic was a huge driver, but I think what we did that was probably one of the better things is we had a core group of people who were already working together. We were already collaborating before <clears throat> the pandemic started. <clears throat> so when we decided it's time to do something a little bit bigger and a little bit different, and we opened the doors. We limit. We we made a kind of an unlimited membership, uh, wide open. Let's see what we get, and we'll weed it out as we go. What we realized we did have to weed it out. And as Anthony said earlier, there were some um, some issues with some people voicing too much political opinion and banter. And then immediately when we noticed that, we 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 threw about twelve more admins in there. People who volunteered. To just help. No, moderation it just be. is no small task. Oh, that no. takes a lot of time. So to, initially, uh, just my wife and I were adminning the whole thing, and she's a full-time college professor, administrator. I, I'm full-time ADE. We didn't have time to do it. So we had, as we say, some of our, 12 of our best friends who said, hey, we'll help. <laughs> and they did. But what they also did, too, is they helped spread the word. And as we started spreading the word, and like Anthony said, it, it, initially, you know, when you see something like that, you're thinking, is this DOE driven? Is this um, compliance driven? Is this, you know, mandate driven? It was nothing like that at all. It just, it was so homogenous, just generic, everything just people started throwing in together. And we just realized that in, immediately, number one, we had to set some rules and some boundaries. That was a learning lesson because we'd never had a page grow that fast. But we also just had to leave it kind of open too because people were scared. They were nervous about going back to teaching. They were, to, to, they were petrified. They were like, what are we going to do? I don't know what to do. And they were, they were just, they needed someone to talk to. They needed people to hear them, but not only just hear them, but to respond to them in a positive manner. So from the get-go, we said there's not going to be any negativism in here. We're not going to slam people for being scared. I was scared of COVID we were all just trying to make it a very positive experience. So right off the bat, we had all these positive people. And as you get more and more positivity going, it just builds and builds and builds and you have all this synergy going and people are just having a really kind of a good time during a bad time. I know that's kind of weird. Um, and if you can laugh during the bad times, you know, it gives you a chance to breathe. And um, we, we didn't have a lot to laugh about at first. We had a lot of things to be scared about. But I've always had this, this thing in my mind that you find a way to laugh. You've got to find a way to laugh during the toughest, hardest moments, the darkest moments. you got to find a way to laugh. And if you can figure out a way to find some levity, if you will, uh, during those types of dark moments, whether it be a pandemic or whether it just be something you're dealing with personally, this was an outlet, one of those outlets for educators to not just gripe and spread hate, this was a very positive eye-opening. Uh, we were trying to have a little bit of light during the darkness and it just grew, Heather. I can't say that Brandy and I or any of the admins did anything special to make it happen other than we kept it positive. And I think that's what we need, not only then, but we need it now as we move forward. And well, Heather, Heather, I, I just want to jump in there just real quick and, and yeah. say from someone who was not part of the creation of this, but someone who was a user, um, I think Don hit on what what spoke to me and spoke to um, a lot of the reason that that it saw the growth. Number one was that it was not a um, a mandated, you know, something that teachers felt like, oh, this is just another thing that's coming down the pipeline from 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 
the the crystal palace so to speak um you know one the more you know don and his wife the more you'll know that they're they're what i call real people um and um they they do care and people pick that up from them and they picked them that up from them from that group but i think i think one of the biggest things that saw the the exponential growth in that page and the reason that teachers were sharing it was that you think back to you know where we were as a nation in uh, march april may and and beyond um you know don said negativity i mean let's just call it what it was most of what you saw online or on the news was either negative about COVID or negative about the election cycle that we were in. And, I, you know, I think that was part of the reason that this was so successful is that teachers could go there. They knew that that uh, they knew that um, that they uh, that that positivity would be there of sharing uh, resources, sharing thoughts, sharing feelings that are appropriate with like-minded individuals without having to worry about whether you're attacked because you are one political affiliation or another, or being attacked because you were really scared of COVID or you thought it was a hoax. You know, uh, it was a place that all that washed away and it was more of, we're gonna focus on educating kids. We're gonna focus on the positive positivity around our, our profession. And, and that's why I think um, Don and Brandy made this so successful because they kept the lens on that portion and didn't let it go to those other areas. Well, we saw at Digital Wish, we saw a sort of a massive clamoring for content right when COVID hit because there were so many teachers who were now faced with remote learning for the first time. And uh, we did a research study right when COVID hit and found that nationwide, 11 million students didn't have internet connections at home. And so teachers were trying to figure out not only how to become good distance learning educators, but also how do I reach those kids who don't have an internet connection at home? So we had the whole paper packet thing. There's you know so many different strategies uh, that were put out there, but let's shift gears for a minute because um, one of the biggest, I'll call it clamoring, uh, clamoring moments was when uh, schools and states realized, well, we have kids who aren't connected at home. How are we going to bring them back to their education? And they had to procure large quantities of hotspots. And so uh, let's turn topics now and let's talk about how do you procure 20,000 hotspots? How do you do a large scale, massive purchase of hotspots at a time when supply chain is getting broken because there's so much demand. Um, you know, there's multiple vendors on the market, but there's all kinds of issues around getting that hardware delivered. I mean, I know it took eight months for a lot of schools to even get their first uh, laptops and hotspots coming through the system because the supply chain had such huge demands. So, uh, Tell us, you know, speaking to this slide, tell us what you guys did to get those hotspots to make a large purchase and what are all those sort of things around it that you learned and, and you know, things you had to do with vendors and all of that sort of thing to make this process go more smoothly. And Heather, I'm glad we're, we're jumping into this, this subject as well, but I want to I reflect on something that you mentioned earlier um back in march everyone became a first year teacher again every single teacher in the country every administrator became a first year administrator and teacher again and that really changed how we had to think about things so that kind of leads into what we were doing so we realized we had to change how we procure things and how we move we couldn't wait on the three to six or nine month procurement cycle one thing that anthony and i are very very fortunate and blessed to have is we have a direct line to the governor's office. And we have a direct line to our commissioner slash secretary. He's not someone over in a tower that we don't see. I see him every single day. Anthony can visit with him any day of the week and our deputy commissioners and the governor's office. We have direct lines of communication. So when you're a state that has that kind of collaboration going on, it's much easier to be nimble and move and flow with what's going on around the state or around the country. And I had a lot of colleagues across the country who, do, who don't have 
this type of connection with their leadership. So for us, that was a huge thing to be able to have that connectivity. Well, I remember the governor's office calling myself and, the, and one of the deputy commissioners and said, what can we do? We're getting this money that's being emergency funded to the states, SO1, what can we do? Immediately, I said, well, I need about $600 million so we can make sure every kid's connected. Of course, you know what kind of response I got with that. <laughs> Well, they said, how about 3 million? I said, how about six? And then finally we settled on 10 and we were so fortunate to get $10 million. And here's what was even cooler about that. I didn't have to deal with someone standing on top of me telling me how to do this. They said, Don, you and your team figure it out. And so back in my background as a former director of technology and dealing with all the procurement processes I dealt with, I'd already had established relationships with some of the big vendors in the state who were also under state contract. So we realized how can we maximize this $10 million to get connectivity to as many kids as we can? Well, the governor kind of had an idea, we had an idea, and then some of our people in between had an idea. And we just decided to go for it. We looked at who was on the state contract, who was, who was as flexible as we were in making this happen. And we said, guys, we're starting face-to-face -face education and digital education, August 24 through 26. That's a non-negotiable. We had that non-negotiable early on that we knew we were going to have school in some fashion or form, whether it be face-to-face -face completely, virtual completely, or a mixture of both. Well, as we got closer to the date, we realized uh, we were going to be doing a combination of those. So how can we connect kids? We have, like you said, tons of kids who live in very rural areas who may have a decent or reasonable cell phone connection. And we thought, easy peasy, let's do hotspots. Well, what we realized is we need to get ahead on this as soon as possible because number one, supply and demand. I noticed early on because I have really good direct connections with a lot of the major providers that we need to jump on this bus as fast as we can, get connectivity going. I was having phone calls uh, till 10 or 11 at night with different vendors talking to them about what can you do, what can't you do? What does it need to look like? What does it look like in other states? And what was great, or not great, what was crazy is they said, no other state's doing this right now. We're still just having very preliminary talks with them. You guys are already ready to cut a check and start paying for things. And I thought, man, I'm really lucky to have that ability to do that. So we decided how many kids can we connect with $10 million? Well, if we were just going to do it for one year, we could have connected a lot more kids. But the governor said, the pandemic's not going to be gone in just one year. We need to really think about a two-year project here, something that has little flexibility in it. But he said, I want it to be unlimited bandwidth. We want, and I said to my, to my team, I want it to have SIPA compliance. It has to be uh, Child Internet Protection Act uh, capable devices, but we got to get them out as soon as possible. So we were meeting every single day, two and three times a day with different vendors trying to build out what this device package would look like. We wanted two years. We wanted as many hotspots as we could get. We wanted, we wanted them all to give them to us for $10 a month. Of course, we couldn't work that price that low, but they said we can do about 15, 14 to $15 a month on a two year contract with the device included, which was one of the things I said, you gotta give us the device free. And they did. And the three vendors I was talking to all had kids who were in schools, who were needing connectivity. And when you have people who are, who are more than just vendors to you, who are partners in education, who have kids in the schools, they have a different emotional connection. And so we were able to leverage that and make this happen. So it was really um, a very timely thing that the governor's money was available and that he gave us enough to do that. We only hit a small percentage of the kids, but our schools were so appreciative because at the time, they didn't know what they were going to do. They were still trying to find PPE. They were still trying to find just basic laptops and Chromebooks and whatnot. And this took one of those little pieces of burden off of them that we could help leverage some of our statewide power with. So, Don, one of the things you did that's unusual that I've, as I talk to other states, um, one of the things you did that's unusual is you you used multiple vendors to deliver similar product out. So you, you didn't just say $10 million, three bid, we're gonna give it to one vendor. Obviously there were supply chain issues and 
nobody could deliver, you know, some amount or too much amount. Um, but what did you have to do to isolate certain uh, po procurement points across all the vendors to get a consistent, I, I mean, did you have to uh, create consistent requirements or what, what were sort of those hoops that you had to create in order to make multiple vendors be able to fit into the same contract? Because that's, that's not a, a typical scenario. You're right, so. it's not. And it, and it was um, a little bit tough to navigate those waters. But what we did is we, we set the basic requirements and we said, here are our basic requirements. Um, you three vendors are already on state contract. You can either play or not. You're either in or you're out. And they had to make a decision very quickly. We didn't give them months to make a decision. We gave them days. We said, if you can meet these basic requirements that we've set, set forth here, you can be a player. So technically, it could have only been one supplier had it only one supplier met our requirements. But as competition goes, uh, one thing I'm not opposed to is haggling. And I'll haggle vendors, I'll haggle, haggle anyone. I've been, it's been my whole career just about. I never take the first answer. I always look for the additional answers that I want to hear. But what we did is we set a foundation. We said, here's our core requirements for anyone who wants to play. Come on board, meet with us. We met with all three vendors at the same time. Instead of having separate meetings, we met with them all at one time and said, here's what our expectations are. Here's what we got to do. Here's how it has to happen. We'll work on the other stuff later. Can you get us devices by the time school starts or within a few weeks or a month after school starts? And they were all able to. We had a few little delays and hiccups. I'm not going to tell you it went perfectly smooth. It did not. And in fact, we had some delays on products, as you can imagine, uh, based on availability and also based on the ability to be SIPA compliant, which was one of the key factors I had to make sure was, was in that. And when the, so governor, the vendors delivered that. Yeah, the vendors delivered all that. There's third parties that can deliver that as well. Yes. What, what were those key points? What were the most important, important points and what were problematic points where you sort of couldn't get that? T tech uh, support was going to be one of our biggest ones. We did not have the manpower, not only in the schools, but at the state level to support administering these devices or the logistics to have 20,000 plus devices shipped to us and then sent out to the schools. I said, we so we created a point of contact list. We create expectations for those people's, people in the schools. And then we had our vendors directly drop ship devices to those schools. I created a, 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 an Excel spreadsheet with how many devices were going to all the schools based on their uh, student numbers, enrollment numbers. Initially, uh, folks wanted us to do it based on free and reduced launch. And I said, no, we don't have time for all of that. Every school in the state of Arkansas has a need for devices, every one of them. It doesn't matter if you're a rich school, poor school, because connectivity doesn't only impact poor kids. It impacts kids who also have financial resources as well. So I wanted to make sure we gave as even a distribution as we could across the state based on student population to get them at least the bare minimum. Now, the requirements on that was it had to be the kids who had the most need, kids who didn't have devices at home, kids who were probably free and reduced lunch kids. So we gave a little flexibility to the schools as well to decide how to distribute. But our ultimate goal was to get them to the schools as soon as possible. And that, that was those are some of the things, hurdles. They were pretty high hurdles to, to get across. But we were able to manage that and mitigate all the problems we dealt with. Uh, I had to, uh, I didn't hire an additional person. But I gave one of my people an additional workload of managing this with the vendors daily. I took him off some of his other tasks. So I had to have the flexibility to free him up. And Heather, it was very daunting at first. Uh, for about three months, we, we, were, we were running really, really, really hard to make this happen. And then everything just started kind of falling into place. We also wanted to make yeah, sure that we told our vendors, not only are you going to extend this pricing to us, but if our schools want to buy additional devices, we want you to extend the same contract pricing, the same multiple year ability, availability, free devices, and all that as well under the same exact pricing structure. And they all three agreed to do that. That's fantastic because then the schools who have budgets of their own, even potentially PTA money, yes. can kick in and they can start to backfill the, yes. the basis, the foundation that the state has put in place. We had several of those who were coming out of the woodwork to, to jump up and say, how can we help 
such yeah. and such school and they were getting private funds public funds whatever they private could funds yeah there's yep. a lot of private yep. funds out there foundational funds like digital wish we do a lot of grants to schools as well and um so finally what would uh what advice would you give to someone who's trying to tackle this now in hindsight looking back at all the things that you went through what were those sort of one two or three key lessons that you learned where you said Oh my gosh, if I did this again, I would ship directly to home. I would do, you know, what are what are those key points? Maybe that's not one of them, but I would want to to drive home a little bit more about the tech support piece from the vendor directly to the home. We kind of do we kind of have a middleman with the schools being kind of that tech support. It works pretty well, but I would want that to be more of a direct contact. So when a kid is at home and he or she is having trouble with that device, I want that kid to be able to call directly to that vendor to a support line from that vendor. That was one thing I would like to see done better uh, because we can't work 24 seven and, and they, they have probably more resources than we do to support those components. Um, another thing- Do the vendors, do the vendors to, provide the tech support? I mean, one, thing's, one of the things that we do at Digital Wish to is a degree. to uh, just make it so that the device delivers and all they do is put in a password. So. We, we tried to make it that simple. My, my, my philosophy on that is it has to be light switch simple. Uh, and I want yeah. it to be that. I want it to be light switch simple. When you get the device, you turn it on and it works. We had some stumbling blocks with one of the vendors because of a, a more difficult corporate structure. Two of the other vendors were super mobile and were able to work around some of that corporate structure. And had in hindsight, I probably, if I had more time, I probably would have held their feet to the fire a little bit more. And I'm not here to badmouth any vendor. Every vendor was dealing with struggles trying to just get product. I probably would have held their feet to the fire a little bit more. But if I were giving anyone out there that's listening advice, don't be afraid to ask. If you need something from a vendor or a partner, if they're a true partner, they're going to try to help you get it. And if they really care about kids and what we're doing in education above the dollar sign or above the, hitting that number every month, they're gonna help you as much as they can. And I will say this, all three of our vendors, T-Mobile, AT&T and Verizon, all stepped up when we really, really asked them to. They did everything they could. They bent over backwards. They, they, they gave us inside information on things that, um, that we had concerns about that they wouldn't normally do during a competitive bidding process. It was an open book and we had to be that way because I kept driving home to them. We have to have kids learning. We cannot let them sit at home without any connectivity or any method for continuing education. And they said, we're here to help you. And I will say this, uh, we were very thankful to have those connections with those three vendors before the pandemic. We'd already had those, those relationships built before that. And so it was really, was it easy? No. Did it work? Yes. Was it perfect? No. What kind of grade would I give us? I'd give us an A minus, a B plus on how the project went. Um, had I do it, if I have to do it again, you know, for a couple more years, we've already got 90% of the, the problem solved already for, from dealing with it this year. So I'm ready to move forward if we want to get more money and do it again. So. Well, extending that contract is critical because the, the schools can take it on. There's a lot of money coming down the pipeline now from federal sources. And um, if you've heard about the ECF funding, it's a new E-rate program that's coming down. There is $7 billion in technology funding that literally covers hotspots for the home yep. and laptops for the home, devices yep. for the home, uh, for anybody who does not have connectivity and who does not have a device. Now, with that kind of money coming down, having those contracts in place, that is that is a key, a critical mm -hmm. um piece of the puzzle to be able to then extend that out. So let me shift gears now. I want to talk about the resources uh, once you get the hotspots in. And, and uh, um, you know, now that we've got hotspots, we have teachers who, um, who are trying to figure out what this online learning is anyway, and how does that get implemented? There's a lot of support that needs to happen behind the scenes. And I know you guys were sort of headstrong, getting all of that stuff done. So let me share uh, uh, some of the things um, that you guys did and we'll, we'll talk about some of these things. And um, Anthony, I wanna turn it over to you a little bit, talk about some of the things that your office did to uh, support the teachers once they got the devices. 
Sure, and I hope Don will open his mic and kind of go back and forth a little bit on this one because uh, there was much more than just my office. You know, our, our computer science and computing initiative, I want to go back to something that Don said earlier. Um, you know, overall, the, the initiative in Arkansas, the computer science and computing initiative, which is kind of seen as leading the nation in this space or is seen as leading the nation in, in this uh, educational space, the reason for that is what Don mentioned earlier, the access that, that I have had uh, to the governor's office, to the governor himself, to the secretary, to the assistant and deputy commissioners, um, and just not having to deal with a lot of the bureaucracy that, that sometimes other uh, entities have to or other states have to. Uh, when I go out and advise other states and they're looking at creating a position like mine, mine was the first position of this nature in the nation. We're now up to about 22 states that have a similar position. But when I'm talking to leaders about creating a position like this and they show me there's, I say, okay, where is it in, in your organizational structure? And if it's six layers deep in bureaucracy, I said, you might as well just save the money. Don't even create it because they're not going to be able to get anything done. So just going back to what echoing what Don said, I think that 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 availability for us to be empowered. And I think that's a lot of Don. It's not just the access. It's the empowerment that that is provided by our leaders to here is your charge. Here's what we need you to do. Now you go figure it out and get it done. Um, but some, you know, what I kind of want to share today is, is a few of our things that we thought were very successful. My team, which uh, I have uh, nine statewide specialists, uh, computer science specialists, I have two internal office team members here on our, our CS initiative. We've done a lot of different things over the past year to try to meet teachers where they are. Our state has done a lot of things. Uh, in fact, uh, Don probably knows more about this than I do, but um, our one of our deputy commissioners, Ms. Stacy Smith, was sharing a story the other day, I believe, about that uh, we had opened up a call center that we had put out that if parents needed help with this uh, with this uh, homework that their kids had those paper packets or those online packets that they could call and reach um, a curriculum specialist here at Department of Education. And that call center was supposed to be open till eight o'clock. And I, I don't remember which employee it was, but one of the employees, you know, it was like, I think it was probably 7.55 or ish and the phone rang and he said, I don't know if I want to answer that. You know, it's, it's five minutes and somebody's calling and he's like, no, we're here till eight o'clock. So he picks up the phone and it happened to be a news reporter from the central Arkansas area and said, I just wanted to see if y'all would actually answer the phone this late. And so, um, you know, uh, that's the kind of commitment that our agency had, but I'm going to share a few things. Um, you know, we had our, our ready for learning plan that Arkansas put out, which Don and the assistant commissioners and deputy commissioners and Department of Health all work closely together to develop, and they did a phenomenal job on that. Um, we, we looked at, you know, across the board, we looked at how did our standards, you know, we had, we've written academic standards for 20 plus years, but I think the pandemic, like a lot of things, we learned lessons of maybe how we weren't necessarily doing things the most effective for learning. And, and the nice thing about our leadership is we are rethinking some of that. Uh, we're thinking how that how we approach that. Um, you know, if you'll if you'll go to the next slide and and one of my one of my big things um, that that early on this initiative that started driving me crazy is the words new normal. I, I just, every time I heard that, I started cringing because everybody was just using it. So I started calling it rethinking the normal. It's not a new normal. We're just rethinking what our normal is. And so my team early on, we looked at creating uh, an AMI document, a simple Google sheet. Rethinking the normal. What are you using Google, Google Sheets for or different uh, online uh uh, uh, you know, tools. How are you using them differently to meet the needs of your your uh, your your customers, if you will? Um, and this sheet was, you know, it hasn't been updated in a couple months, but early on we were updating it almost daily. Uh, we would go out and research uh, vendors as they were putting on uh, 
special promotions or, or, or things that they were doing to uh, help families in pandemic time of need. Whenever Don was launching the uh, the um, you know the the wireless devices, we were putting that information on there. Uh, we also put it re put resources on there of, of how teachers, how parents, which were the teachers in many instances at that point, could continue helping their students learn. The computer science content because early on this initiative let's be honest and i think don will test this we were just trying to figure out how to get math science social studies uh those those core areas covered uh and taught to effective manner so things like computer science um though i, I do want to have a comment about that we're, the other areas were kind of going to the wayside a little bit so we want to make sure we got that information out there um you know and 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 uh, that 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 then brings me to the next tool, and, and we share this quite often. The next slide, um, and this again is just an example of taking something that everybody has been exposed to over the past year and just rethinking what the normal is with it. So last year on March nineteenth, we launched what we called the Computer Science Coffee Cafe, uh, and really what it was first intended to be was just a place that my team, myself included, would hang out in. It would be open all day that teachers or parents or students could drop in and get help with computer science. We were willing to help with, you know, pretty much any computing. I'm a math teacher by, you know, originally, so I could have helped out with math, but nobody asked me anymore to do that, and that's fine. Um, but, you know, we were there, we were there eight to four o'clock. Um, it has grown since then. We this is now our digital office, Heather. I think you've you've had a meeting in there, and <laughs> um, you know I was looking at it last night. I was looking at some of the statistics on it. You know, my team, my team of twelve, we each have our own office in there, and then we have four do not disturb rooms that we have our check in meeting in the morning. Then we all go to our digital offices, and if one of us needs one the other. We can just hop in there. It removes that formality of email and other things of that nature that that are sometimes you don't want to use that. But in one year, looking from May 25th to May 25th, we've had 287 coffee cafe sessions. Okay, we've had uh, an average of 434 minutes per session of that coffee cafe open over 2,074 hours of it open and manned by at least one member of my staff and, and often quite quite more than that. And I looked at the participants and one year we had over 6,300 participants log into that cafe, which is an average of 22 per session or think about it per, per day. And if you think about my team, that's about 12 people. Um, you know, that means that on average, at least 10 Arkansas educators, our partners are logging in that to interact with our team. We're able to interact as a team together. And it's it's something that everybody knows how to use is, is, is Zoom. And it's just rethinking that that purpose. But I do want to hit on something that that Don kind of alluded to and then then I kind of hit again. You know, I Don tries to find a way to to laugh. I try to find the 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 positive in negative situations. So I think we're saying the same thing. We just look at it from a different approach and that may be my logistical mindset on that. But, you know, from a computer science and computing perspective, um, you think about the past year and you think about the learning that has taken place across the board from student to parent. How many parents now have a better understanding of what bandwidth actually means? How many people took a crash course in cybersecurity over the last year? Um, how many people understand supply chain much better because they're frustrated they can't get their kid um, uh, these different devices? So I look at that as a positive for my initiative, a positive for our nation, a positive for our state, that we now have a populace who understands the importance of computer science and computing more than just programming, which it is more than just programming because they just lived a year of understanding why it's so critical. So I just wanted to throw that in there and, and you know, once again, promote what we're doing in this space as a state, but also share, you know, take the tools that you're using every day. I know everybody's Zoomed out. Everybody's tired of Zoom and other, and I say Zoom because we're on there and that's what primarily I use, but whether it be Teams or uh, whatever it is, everybody's tired of it. Rethink how you're using it. If you're using it just for meetings all day long, then yeah, you're probably tired of it. Use it a way to reconnect with your staff and, and, and your customer. 
Coffee cafe. I mean, at, yes, I've been in it and I've seen you're using actually standard tools like Zoom and the Zoom breakout rooms to set that up. So um, explain how if you uh, were starting from scratch and you wanted to do your own coffee cafe for your school or district and you were an administrator, explain, you know, what would you do? Would you get a certain Zoom license? Would you set up three breakout rooms? Would you have people moderating? How would how would that work? So, so basically what my team did, my team all have their own Zoom paid accounts. Um, uh, you know, you don't have to have a paid account to do this. It just requires a little bit more legwork if, you, if everybody doesn't have their own paid account uh, once you start the meeting. Whoever the administrator that sets up the meeting uh, originally, and we just have a recurring meeting every day, they can set up pre-made breakout rooms. They can assign people by email address to those rooms. Um, and they can assign uh, what's called co-host. So for example, all my team members are considered co-host of my meeting. The first person that comes in there gets hosting privileges and everybody else that's on that pre-approved -pre list are co-hosts. Once we open it up in the morning, we do have to click open breakout rooms. But when you do that, you'll see the list of our 12 team members, their rooms pop up with the four do not disturb rooms below. And those do not disturb rooms were something that we created after a few months of this, because there are times where I need to be in Zoom, so I might need to jump in and see one of our other team members, but I don't need them jumping in to see me uh, because I'm in the middle of of uh, a, a, a webinar such as this, you know, my, my, my coffee cafe is open over here, but I'm in a do not disturb room. So I've got two Zoom windows going, but if I need to jump in and see one of my other employees, I could real quick and I give them the same courtesy. If they're working on something and they're in that do not disturb room, everybody understands, leave them alone uh, during that time um, because they, they've got something important going on, but it gives us a way to interact, uh, freely. And that's really that, what that rethinking normal comes to take those tools that you use regularly and rethink how they can be more effective, uh, and, and, and help you when, when you're trying to solve this, this divide that COVID has, has created between all of us. And Heather, I want to add too that you don't have to break the bank to do this. These are very basic tools. And like Anthony said, just rethinking them and just repurposing these things, something we've had to do this entire year during the pandemic is repurposing a lot of the tools that we were using that were just kind of cool and techie oriented. Now they've become part of our normal day. And, and those are things we shouldn't go put back in a box and not use anymore. Anthony's still going to use this. I think this is going to be their new way of doing things from now on. So. Hey, geeky is the new cool, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to share my screen one more time and uh, uh, give you a few things to think about on our way out here. Uh, any final comments to talk about planning ahead for the technology amid a, pan amid a pandemic? <laughs> Who would have thought we'd be saying that a year ago? <laughs> well, I can say one thing. Uh, there, there's a lot of information coming out really, really rapidly. Make sure you read about it. Like uh, Heather, you mentioned the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Learn yeah. as much about that as you can. Learn much as much about the Mercy Broadband benefit. That's that's something for families. Share those tools. Share all that information with your families. Your don't just share it with the kids. Share it with the families as well. Have a good communication plan. But do things. Do do new things or different old things differently now. Try, try to take some of the old processes or the old tools. Repurpose those. Utilize them differently now. Don't try to stick them back in that old box. Uh, I also created and threw a link out there for our Ready for Learning resource guide, which is our whole website full of everything. But guys, we, we, th this is the opportunity that us in the ed tech world have all been waiting for, to showcase and tell everybody we can do this whole educational thing in a different way, but not, it doesn't have to be the only way. It can be one of the many ways and personalized learning and personalized teaching so that we can all do it in a different way and meet the needs of every kid and every teacher and every parent. We have a lot of opportunity ahead of us. And I'm just gonna add in just real quick, you know, we we are past the the fire zone of, of COVID-19. We're, we're, we've, we're seeing, as somebody said the other day, we're seeing that light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train uh, any longer. Um, there's a huge, as you mentioned earlier, Heather, there's a huge amount of money coming down, uh, probably more than we'll ever. Huge. 
huge probably more than we'll ever see again as a nation being funneled yeah. into education it's time to be purposeful and thoughtful in how we spend this money but it's also time for us to remember, and, and as a computer science and computing leader, I, I value digital learning, and I, I think it, it's going to be crucial and critical to our, our, um, our, our continued success. But I think also after this past year, we have to also start looking at how to bridge back that personal divide, um, not just that digital divide that students saw, but we have come out of a year of everybody being uh, separated, uh, you know, socially distanced, and I'm not telling anybody to go out there and violate social distance, but start thinking about how you can start bridging some of that person, personal uh, relationships that are so critical to the growth of our students, so critical to the, the happiness of our populace, um, along with as we look at bridging this digital divide, it's, it's just so important for our students. Don't forget that piece. Well, thank you, Don. Thank you, Anthony. I cannot thank you enough for coming on and sharing some of your experiences because, as we mentioned, there is an enormous amount of money coming down the pipeline from the federal government in the form of ECS, ECF funding and EBB, which is home funding for hotspots in the home. And this money is enormous. I, uh, you know, I am ex so excited that we can solve the digital divide using some of this funding, but the key to it is that we apply, is that we're ready, is that we take these lessons that we've learned and we then use them to set up our procurement systems properly to you know, be smarter about, about how we take these next steps and learn from the consulting the prior art. So keep your eye on the webinar series. We've got some fantastic webinars coming down the pipeline on ECF funding, on a lot of the different funding sources. If you're a corporation, on how corporations can get involved to do public-private financing, uh, setting up corporate programs, and for schools, curriculum, uh, curriculum ideas, um, hardware ideas, setting up lending libraries, all that kind of stuff. So keep your eye on the series and um, you know, tune in, tune in and share. So thank you, Don. Thank you, Anthony, again. And thank you, State of Arkansas, for being so far ahead of the curve thank you, when, uh, you know, such an incredible crisis came down the pipeline. So yeah, uh, thank you, Don. Good to My see pleasure. you. <laughs> Good to see you, Anthony. <laughs> All right. Well, have a great day, everyone. All right, take care. Solve the digital divide. <laughs>